Is this Jesus from Nazareth really the Messiah? I saw him enter Jerusalem riding on a donkey colt. Didn't the prophet Zechariah predict this day? Didn't Zechariah also tell us that the Messiah would bring peace to Jerusalem and to the world? I don't know what to think. The only thing this Jesus brought to Jerusalem was conflict. Jesus even told members of our Sanhedrin that the kingdom of God was being taken from us and given to another nation. Is this Jesus going to give our national promise to the Gentiles? This cannot be. I don't see how this Jesus can be the Messiah. I think maybe the Pharisees are right. This Jesus is only a deceiver. These may have been the thoughts of the people of Jerusalem trying to understand the dichotomy presented by the actions of Jesus. The final week of Jesus continues. His last days are coming quickly. The day had arrived for the preparation of the Passover feast. Christ selected Peter and John and entrusted them with the responsibility of this preparation. The celebration was to take place on the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. The entire Passover season was referred to as the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and this season was seven days in length. It would appear that from the days of the Diaspora, the Jews added an extra day to this festival season and called it the Day of Preparation. There exists debate concerning the Last Supper of Jesus as to whether the meal was a Passover celebration or not. The synoptics explicitly state that the Last Supper was a Passover celebration, while the Gospel of John states that the Last Supper was the day before the Passover. How do we resolve this conflict? H.W. Honer, in the chronological aspects of the life of Christ, harmonized the apparent conflict between the Synoptic Gospels and the Gospel of John by proving there existed in the days of Jesus two methods of time calculation concerning the Passover. The Galilean method was used by the Galileans and the Pharisees who reckoned time from sunrise to sunrise. According to this method, the Passover lamb was sacrificed between 3 and 5 p.m on Thursday, April 2nd. Jesus and the Synoptics used this method. The writings of Josephus confirm the fact that the Pharisees reckoned the Passover from sunrise to sunrise because all the Passover was to be eaten by the morning of the next day. The Judean method was used by the Sadducees to reckon the time of the Passover from sunset to sunset. According to the Judean method, the Passover celebration began at sunset on Thursday, April 2nd, and ended at sunset on Friday, April 3rd. According to this method, the Passover lamb was sacrificed on Friday, April 3rd, between 3 and 5 p.m. The Gospel of John used this method to record the Passion Week. This method of calculation is also confirmed by the Mishnah. The Passover meal was to be eaten by midnight, thus confirming the sunset to sunset position. It is obvious the Pharisees and the Sadducees could not even agree on the dates of Passover. Therefore, two days were needed to offer the sacrifices presented by the nation. Compromise was needed to not offend the Pharisees, therefore the Sadducees agreed to two days of Passover sacrifices. This decision also allowed more time to sacrifice the large volume of lambs needed for the Passover. A great deal of effort was involved in the preparation of the Passover, and the Lord commissioned Peter and John with the task of preparing the meal. It would appear that Jesus made secret arrangements with the man in the city of Jerusalem 
and their sign was to look for a man carrying a pitcher of water. The disciples were to follow this man to his house. Jesus wanted to celebrate this Passover without the Sanhedrin trying to arrest him. It was the responsibility of the head of each family to purify the Passover room with prayers. They would pray, Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with thy commandments and requires us to remove the leaven. At this point, a thorough search of the room was made to remove every crumb that could be found. A further search was made for any liquid or solid product of fermented grain and for all dishes or vessels that held it. Once the house was purified, then the vessels to be used in the feast were cleansed with prescribed ritual. The two disciples were required to purchase the necessary lamb needed during the morning hours of Thursday, April 2nd. The sound of the ram's horn trumpets announced from the temple the beginning of the feast. At the sound of the horn, everyone took his lamb to the temple. The countless sacrifices must be first examined by the priests to see if they were without blemish. The worshipers were admitted in three divisions within the court of the priests. When the first company entered, the massive Nicor gates were closed. At the sound of three blasts from the horn, the lambs were slain. It would appear that Peter and John were in the first of the three groups because of the time needed to prepare the Passover meal. While this process was going on, the Halal was being chanted by the Levites. Save now, I beseech thee, Lord. O oh, Lord, I beseech thee, send prosperity. Blessed be he that comes in the name of the Lord. The last part of the Halal was a messianic reference. This reference was the implication behind the words of Christ to the weeping women on his way to Calvary. A blast on the silver trumpets blown in the temple announced to all Jerusalem that the Passover had arrived. And that hour found Jesus and his disciples reclining at the table that had been prepared for this occasion. The Old Testament observance of the Passover not only looked back to Israel's previous redemption from the bondage of Egypt, but also looked forward to the coming of the Lamb of God who would deliver Israel from the bondage of sin. According to Luke, the Passover was to find its ultimate fulfillment, not in the cross, but rather in the kingdom of God. Christ's death was not an end, but an entrance into the kingdom of God. The Passover points to the marriage feast of the Lamb that would be experienced in the kingdom of God. Therefore, those who eat of the Passover are betrothed to Christ. According to Luke, the Passover observance began with strife and contention among Christ's disciples as to which one of them should be accounted as the greatest. According to Asian custom, during a great feast, it was common for the guest of honor to assume the center reclining place at the table, and the rank of guests would be determined by their position to the master of the feast. This was a common practice seen among the Pharisees. According to John, we understand that John was reclining on Jesus' right, but the place of greatest honor was the position to the left of Jesus. John also recorded that the position of highest honor belonged to Judas Iscariot. Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, 
The one who is at the table, or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. Jesus rebuked his disciples by calling them Gentiles. He stated that the kings of the Gentiles fight and strive to expand their lordship. The irony of the kingdom of this world is that the kings of the earth strive to be benefactors over other kings. We see the title of benefactor used in reference to the Greeks, to the kings of Egypt and even Syria. Jesus stated that the kingdom of God would not function like the kingdoms of this world. The promotion and authority found in the kingdom of God would be established in self-humiliation, not self-exaltation. The servant attitude releases the promotion of the kingdom of God. Jesus again stressed to his disciples that the servant attitude would release the power and mind of the kingdom. Let it be understood. Jesus did not state that in the kingdom of God there would be no authority or government, but he clearly revealed that the authority of the kingdom would be released in us as we develop the servant attitude. When the supper ended, the devil put into the heart of Judas Iscariot to betray the Christ. Jesus, knowing that treason was in his midst, rose from his position, assumed the role of a humble servant, and washed the feet of his disciples. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Why did Jesus do this? It was customary at the Feast of Passover for the host to instruct a servant to wash the feet of all the participants. A servant, or the one in the lowest position among those participating would perform this task. It's apparent that none of the disciples would rise from the table to perform this humble task of washing the feet of the other disciples. To perform such a task would make a public announcement that this disciple considered himself the least when each one wanted to be the greatest. Since none of his disciples would seek the role of a servant, Christ presented himself as the servant to his disciples. Submission to the washing was a sign of personal confession for the need of cleansing and an affirmation of faith in Jesus as Messiah. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. When Jesus came to Simon Peter to wash his feet, Peter refused because he didn't understand the thing Jesus was doing. Therefore Jesus admonished him that should he not wash his feet, he would have no part with him. Christ was not saying that Peter would have no relationship to him in salvation. But he was saying that Peter would not experience fellowship with him until he was willing to accept the cleansing of the Lord. Once Peter understood the importance of Christ washing him, Peter burst out with the declaration that Christ should wash his whole body. Peter's outburst revealed the deep longing of his heart for intimate fellowship with Jesus. Peter said, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus now instructed his disciples as to the significance of his foot washing ceremony. 
Christ performed this task of a servant to reveal the pride and self-exaltation of his disciples. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Jesus emphasized the reality that humility and a servant attitude releases the authority of the kingdom. The foot washing lesson was designed to rebuke the disciples for their attitude of self-exaltation and instruct them in the proper attitude of the kingdom. During his admonishment, Jesus warned his disciples that one of them would betray him. This declaration startled his disciples since no one was able to identify the betrayer. After he had said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, I tell you the truth, one of you is going to betray me. His disciples stared at one another at a loss to know which one of them he meant. The sad truth is that each disciple saw in himself the capability of being that person. And they began to be sorrowful and to say unto him one by one, Is it I? And another said, Is it I? Simon Peter wanted to know who the traitor was. Therefore he leaned over to John and encouraged him to speak to Jesus. Simon Peter mentioned to this disciple and said, Ask him which one he means. Leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is the one to whom I give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Then. Dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, son of Simon. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. What you are about to do, do quickly, Jesus told him. This was a significant event. According to custom, the Passover sop was a reminder of God's promise of salvation. The action of each participant Receiving the bread acknowledged his own personal sinful state. Christ offered Judas Iscariot the first sop that was an offering of salvation and forgiveness of sin if he would accept it. Jesus was offering Judas an opportunity to repent. Christ was offering forgiveness to Judas if he would accept the offered salvation and put his faith in him. Judas took the bread, but there is no record that he ate it as a sign of his acceptance of the Messiah's offer of salvation. It would seem that the moment he took the bread, in his heart he rejected the offer of Jesus. Satan, at this point, entered into Judas, and from that hour, Satan was in full control of Judas's emotions to the point that he left the celebration to betray Jesus. During the Passover celebration, Jesus revealed to the 11 remaining disciples that they would deny him. Christ stated that their final denial would be the fulfillment of Zechariah chapter 13, verse 7, where the prophet stated that when the shepherd was smitten, the sheep would be scattered. At this point, Jesus turned to Peter and said, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Christ addressed these words to Peter because he was recognized as the leader of the disciples. And he was one of the first who recognized the deity of Christ. 
Because of these facts, Satan desired to assault the faith of Peter. It seems that Satan found a root of self-doubt and fear in Peter that he could manipulate. Christ did not pray that his disciples would not deny him. However, Christ prayed that after his disciples denied him, their denial would not cause their faith to fail. Peter responded to Christ's announcement with overconfidence and stated that he was ready to go to prison or even death with him. Jesus, understanding Peter's fear and self-doubt, said, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. Christ warned his disciples of the danger of the coming hour since the shepherd would be killed. The murderers would also seek to kill his disciples. When Christ was among his disciples, it was not necessary for them to make provision for their physical needs, but the darkness of the hour would require the disciples to make provision for their physical needs since they would be in hiding. Bread and wine were significant parts of the Passover meal. Bread was used throughout the Old Testament as a symbol of God's provision for His people, while wine was a symbol of the joy that would be experienced by those in Messiah's kingdom. And He took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Christ wanted His disciples to continue the memorial of the breaking of bread. And this ceremony was to be invoked in the body of Christ until the kingdom of God is established. The breaking of bread is to remind the disciples of the sacrifice of the Lord on Calvary. The fact that Jesus did not use a lamb sacrifice as a memorial is significant. The bread and the wine memorial foreshadowed the break his followers would have with Judaism. And he took the cup, and gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many, for the remission of sins. According to Jesus, the shedding of his blood established a New Testament, a new covenant with humanity, and the effect of this new covenant is the eternal remission of sins. It's imperative we understand the spiritual significance of the Lord's communion. According to the symbols used, it is obvious that by partaking of the communion, we acknowledge our acceptance of the new covenant established in the blood of Jesus and our responsibility to this covenant. When the Passover meal was finished, Christ and his disciples left the upper room and proceeded to the Mount of Olives, to the Garden of Gethsemane. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow. To the point of death, he said to them, Stay here and keep watch. Jesus sensed something had changed. He discerned that his divine protection, provided by the Father, was fading away. Jesus knew this was the day and the hour that he was to be given to the darkness of this world. Jesus knew that he would be delivered into the hands of sinful men. Jesus felt that his hedge of protection was gone, and he was under heavy satanic attack designed to kill him. Jesus understood the prophetic significance of his approaching sacrifice. Jesus understood that the Messiah would be a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, because his soul would become an offering for sin. It would appear that Christ discerned 
the preparation of his soul to be the offering for sin by his father. And he went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed, if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. The strain of Jesus' sufferings caused him to seek the face of his Father, for his soul was convulsing with the satanic attack stimulated with the anticipation of his sin offering. Jesus wrestled with the reality that he was to be the redemption for man by paying man's complete price for sin. Sin caused man to die physically and spiritually. Therefore, Christ had to die physically and spiritually to pay the complete price for sin. Jesus realized that he would die to the reality and influence of his Father because of sin. God would be separated from God. Jesus did not fear physical death. He feared separation from his Father. Even in the face of the terror of Calvary, Jesus denied himself and embraced the will of God. It was at this point Jesus embraced the suffering of Calvary and accepted its judgment. Let it be understood, the true nature and value of our faith and obedience is manifested only when the will of God demands sacrifice of our will and desires. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him, and being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. The suffering of this moment for Christ produced such a high level of stress that his blood pressure reached the point that it caused tiny blood vessels to rupture in his face, causing him to sweat blood. This physical condition, even though rare, is called hemidrosis. The Father sent an angel to strengthen and comfort Jesus. Three times Jesus prayed before the fears of his heart grew silent. When Jesus embraced the total cost of his Father's will, great peace flooded him. Because of prayer, the Father filled Jesus with overcoming peace. Jesus was now ready for Calvary. No one can forget the solemn communion memorial graphically portrayed by Jesus during the Last Supper. But we fail to see the true human interaction caused by the disciples striving for position and supremacy during this supper. The most important meal Jesus would share with his disciples was marred by conflict and selfish social interaction. The admonition given by Jesus not to strive for lordship over our brethren has not been heeded. Since the days of the early apostles to the political maneuvering of the early church bishops, to the striving of the Roman bishop for political supremacy, even to the bloody conflicts between the Western Church led by Rome and the Eastern Church under the authority of Constantinople, human nature has not changed since that eventful night. Our church history is filled with religious conflict and selfish social ambition. It would be easy to dismiss our own bloody church history as not relevant for church dynamics for this present day. But again, human nature has not changed. Sad to say, church politics is alive and well in Christendom today. Brother strives with brother for a larger piece of the church budget. 
while sister strives with sister for more public recognition. One only has to be part of a church staff to see the same type of selfish social interaction displayed by the disciples at the Last Supper. Jesus understood that true spiritual humble service is the master key to unlock the kingdom of God in our midst. Again, church history affirms this truth. Each time this spiritual trait surfaced in the body of Christ, revival broke out. Should we hunger for renewal and revival in our own spiritual lives, then we must use the master key of servanthood. This simple truth can cause confusion because each and every one of us must answer the same simple question. What does it mean to be a servant of Jesus Christ?